Okay, so we've already talked about one of the first areas or disturbances in kids with autism, which is the disturbance in the communication process. Now remember, there's two mandated features. So another mandated feature has to do with disturbances in relating appropriately to people, objects, and events. So it's relating the capacity to relate appropriately. And so sometimes with this area, we see kids that um, resist changes in routine. Uh, they might have extreme distress for no discernible reason. You may not be able to identify they're covering their ears, they're crying, they're laughing. Inappropriate attachment to objects where sometimes they um, are very attached to a specific object. They want to carry it around, interact with it. Um, inappropriate laughing or giggling and sustained odd play. So when we talk about relating, we can break that down into people, objects, and events. So when we're talking about relating to people, sometimes kids with autism don't develop the usual warm relationships that they do with caretakers. Um, and, and so sometimes kids don't really know how to have that interaction. It can be very hard on a parent when kids kind of miss that relationship piece. And they may show a lack of spontaneously seeking to share enjoyment interest the child does not show or bring or point. So again, kids that you know bring the little bowl with the spoon and give everybody a bite or say debt and want to know what that is and those kinds of things, they may appear to not want to relate to people. Doesn't mean that they don't, but sometimes they kind of seem aloof and in their own world. And they may lack a self-awareness of how their behavior or appearance is seen by others. And I gave you some of those examples before where, you know, kids don't recognize that other people um, are looking at them as, as being different. This was a, a student that I had that uh, was like putting his arms hands in his armpits and smelling his fingers and so he didn't understand like why the other kids didn't want to eat lunch with him he just thought it was a, a normal behavior um, and they often lack skills to play cooperatively and make friendships so also in addition to relating to people they may be unaware of social differences so things like authority figures status formal and informal occasions race, gender, age, and specifically how social responses are different in different social situations. So a good example that I, some, I sometimes share is like, there's specific behavior that is appropriate for an elevator. Typically you go into the elevator, you stand a certain direction. It's not unusual for somebody to maybe say, oh, the weather has been such and such, or I like your shoes, like little small talk kind of thing. But some people don't talk at all. They keep, you know, they, they stay completely silent and don't socially interact. But that level of social interaction is about as far as it goes when you're in an elevator with a complete stranger. So in other words, it would be rather weird or uncomfortable if someone says, so can you tell me where you went to high school and how many kids you have? when it's a complete stranger in an elevator. However, let's say you go with your spouse to a Christmas party, you're sitting at a table with a complete stranger who you've never met before that you're having to make small talk. It is completely appropriate to say to that person, hey, where'd you go to school? How many kids do you have? So how do we teach kids with autism that it's okay in one situation and not in another? It becomes very difficult and that's why the social skills are oftentimes challenging because kids have to learn different social rules in different situations. Sometimes they lack an awareness of social rules and customs, and they often lack the ability to predict others' feelings or they act in ways that are unfeeling, so they seem self-centered or aware only of their own needs. And that's not necessarily the case, that's just how they oftentimes appear because of this difficulty with social interaction with people. Also in relating to people, they're sometimes unable to lie or pretend even when it's tactful or polite. I've given some examples with that already. And they often learn social rules and take them literally rather than flexibly. So sometimes kids are very, very literal. Um, <clears throat> when I was teaching this, these kids, uh, there was like a group of kids with learning disabilities, but I had one student with autism. And I found this curriculum, it was called Book Cook, and you read a book and then it came with a little recipe and it was something we were doing in the fall, some kind of Halloween book, and then we were supposed to make marshmallow spiders. So like you use a marshmallow and use um, licorice for the legs and M&Ms for the eyes. I thought, oh, this is gonna be so cute. I hadn't been teaching that long. I thought they'd love it. We'd make these marshmallow spiders based on this book that we read. All my kids were excited. My kid with autism is like, but I don't eat spiders. 
I said, I know, buddy, but it's not a real spider. We're just kind of pretending, you know, we're just making a, a spider out of candy. I don't eat spiders. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, well, maybe you could make phone from your mom. He's like, oh, my mother does not eat spiders. And so I kind of realized like, okay, this is not worth it. Fine, go do something on the computer while we all make our marshmallow spiders. But he couldn't get past the fact that you literally do not eat spiders. So you don't eat any kind of spiders. Um, Sometimes there's a limited appropriate use of nonverbal behavior and difficulties recognizing and responding to subtle nuances, cues, and unspoken messages. Also then, besides relating to people, we have relating to objects. So sometimes they have a greater attachment to objects than to people. And there's some research that shows that there are perhaps certain areas of the brain that have become more developed, the areas that focus on objects versus people like their mother's face when they're very young. Um, they often don't understand the functional use of objects. And this is seen in play where instead of using um, uh, pretending to use toys in adult ways, like I said, taking the soup and giving everybody a bite of it. They use them in odd ways where they spin the plate. And so they don't use those things um, in the in the way that most people would use them. If, for example, I had the student, he would work for a fan. It was just a box fan. His favorite thing, like he would get all of his work finished to be able to turn on the box fan. He took a Kleenex and he would tear the Kleenex, but not all the way. So basically he would tear it into strips, but not all the way. So it made this big long strip of a Kleenex and then he'd tape it to the fan and so the you know the Kleenex would be swirling and then he'd get another one and he'd tape it to the end and there were times that he could get them all the way up to the ceiling he loved working or playing with a fan well that's not the way most people use a fan but that was his way of interacting with the fan he loved it and that's the other one on here many objects uh, uh, are used in idiosyncratic, stereotypic ways, um, they, and they get upset when they're interfered with. I had a kid that always wanted to have a string, and he did like this little stemmy thing where he like would kind of flip it and kind of watch it, and, and he would take the shoelace out of his shoe to have this string. If I interrupted that and said, okay, give me the string so that you can do something else, that would make him upset. And objects are sometimes used for this self-stimulation, this stemming kind of thing that we see. And they're often uninterested in toys and play with them in unusual ways. Also, they don't understand the sequence of events unless they're made concrete and visual. So we looked at, you know, disturbance in relating to people and into objects. The events really have to do with like those changes and schedules that kids really have a hard time with. They have a hard time organizing themselves in the environment and changes in routine. So anytime kids are um, learning a specific routine and there's a change of some sort, that can be very difficult for, for many of our kids. It could be something like, I go to recess every day and now it's raining and I can't go outside, so that's a change in routine. Um, a parent told me one time, she's like, my son knew that he was supposed to go to school Monday through Friday and he had a really hard time with holidays. So or like a like a day off that the teachers had a work day so there was like a, a friday that they didn't have school well, he gets up and gets ready and he's like he's like i'm going to school and mom, mom's trying to say no no, no there, there's no school today well she didn't realize that the kids didn't have school but the teachers still had to work so he's like i gotta go to school it's my you know i have to go to school it's friday i go to school on fridays so she's like, well, I'll just bring him up there. He'll see that the doors are locked and then he'll realize that there's no school. Well, because the teachers were there, the doors were not locked. So he walks in and goes and sits down in his classroom. The teacher comes out of a meeting and sees this parent standing in the hallway. And she's like, what's going on? And he's like, I couldn't get him to not come to school because it's Friday. So he's in there waiting for you. And I think they worked it out. But the idea is, is like some kids don't like any kind of change and, and change can be difficult for them. Um, and so they often have a difficult time adapting to new situations. Sometimes kids, you know, you, you can't decide to rearrange the entire classroom or move desks, uh, spots where kids sit as easily because they have difficulty with those changes. So they need a very stable environment. But I think sometimes what happens is we need to also be careful that we want to give that structured, stable environment. We want to keep things the same so that kids can be successful. But then we also need to make sure that we're teaching ways to accept change because life involves changes. Um, we had an early childhood classroom of kids with autism and things would happen that would change in the environment and they would get upset. So 
All the teachers had to wear lanyards with their um, ID badge on it. So we put on the back of it, we put a, a little card that said, oops. And every time there was some kind of a change, we, we would be able to show that visual and say, oh, this is an oops. So like, for example, they were trying to play the DVD, which they always play after lunch and it wasn't working. And the kids were getting upset. Oh, remember, this is an oops, we're trying to fix it. And so that was something that we were trying to work through by helping the kids with the change. Again, the other piece, if you look at the, the webinar that's on visual strategies, we go through very specifically how to teach chains by change by using visual schedules. And so that's something that you can learn and, and include as well. Okay, uh, so we, we went over the two, communication and relating to people. Those are the two mandatory features. Now there's two associated features, okay? One of them has to do with the developmental rates and sequences, and I've kind of given you an example of this already. But this is where we have that unevenness, and we can see like delays and different things. So kids may move, from sitting directly to walking and they skip crawling or they have this uneven fine and gross motor skills. I had a student who had incredibly good gross motor skills. He was so cool. I loved this kid and he was he just needed so much intervention in the beginning. He, he came when he was probably seven or eight. He couldn't get his hair cut because uh, he didn't like the sensory piece. So he had this long, beautiful curly hair, didn't want to keep clothes on. So his preference was to run around naked with the hair flying in the wind kind of thing. And so we really had to work on like sitting down and, and wearing clothes and getting his hair cut and all these things. But he was this little climber, like he could just climb onto anything. I would, I would put the the Cheez-Its on top of the two-door cabinet so that he wasn't trying to grab them all the time. And, you know, you'd turn around for a half second and he'd have like desks and tables into this, you know, thing that he could climb up and get to anything. So he had this great balance. There was a day we went outside on the playground and, you know, sure enough, the staff, you know, you, you think, I mean, they were really watching him. This is just how fast it happened. Is he just jumps onto the swing set, climbs up and is walking across the top of the swing set. You know, the bar that's like two and a half inches wide and he's walking across it like a tightrope. I'm like, oh my gosh, get George down, he's gonna fall. Although I thought he's probably not gonna fall. He's got such good balance. But so he, I would say his gross motor skills were above average. This particular student could not hold a pencil to write his name, to trace a circle, to trace a straight line. So his fine motor skills were very poor. And that's again where we see that unevenness. We might have kids that have great gross motor, poor fine motor, kids that can read but can't comprehend. Okay, so the next area then has to do with sensory stimuli. And this is that disturbance in their ability to process and understand their sensory systems. So sometimes there's marked physical overactivity or extreme passivity and apparent insensitivity to pain. Also uh, spinning objects, covering eyes and ears, hand flapping, toe walking, not making eye contact. So sometimes we see a lot of these sensory behaviors. We see kids doing some hand flapping, walking on their toes, rocking, different kinds of things that we see. And, and also like noises bother them. And, and you can even see like, you may not hear the noises. Sometimes if you're quiet, you can hear in a classroom the noise that the fluorescent lights make. And so they have a hard time with all of those sensory things. And our brains are able to do what we call screening, where there's lots of sensory things coming in and we can screen what's the most important, perhaps like listening to me versus some other distractions going on. Kids with autism, oftentimes that part of their brain is not working in the same way. And so they're not able to screen. So in other words, every single sensory thing is coming in with equal Four. So the sound of the teacher's voice, the noises in the classroom, the smell, the temperature, and all of those things can make it very overwhelming for kids. Now the sensory differences associated with autism spectrum disorders is not necessarily the diagnosis, but virtually all individuals demonstrate sensory processing individuals, but their strong reactions to these everyday sensations. And so those are things that we look at. Now, not to get into a whole lot of detail, if you want to learn more about the sensory system, it's, it's often very fascinating and interesting things, but there's three main sensory systems, and I'll have a, a 
resource on the website for you to be able to print and download that looks at these. But there's different things. There's one called vestibular. So if you ever hear somebody talking about the vestibular input, that has to do with movement. So that's our kids that are moving and rocking. All kids seek out vestibular input from the time that they're very little. I mean, think about kids, they like to get in a swing, you know, wrap it around real tight and then let it go. They like to roll down hills. I always tell people, why did I buy a couch with removable cushions? Because the cushions were always on the floor for them to dive into like Superman. You know, there's all this movement. And it, when kids are little, there's fluid inside your inner ear. And every time you move, that fluid moves. There's tiny, tiny, hundreds of tiny little hairs called cilia that detects that movement and that helps with that development of the sensory system. How fast you're moving, where you're moving, and all of those kinds of things. Now, something I learned in a workshop that I found that was very interesting, sometimes in a, as adults, we can't handle the movement in the same way. Like sometimes when I'm on a swing, I feel like it's making me a little bit nauseous. And part of that is because as an adult, that fluid has hardened. But for many kids that are still trying to seek out some of that sensory is where they get into the movement and they like to swing and rock and some of those kinds of things. So that's the vestibular. There's another one called proprioceptive and this really has to do with muscle and joint input and allows kids to know where their body is in space. And the muscle and joint put input comes from jarring muscles and joints. So an example I like to give, like if I'm sitting in a chair and I've got my legs crossed and I'm kind of relaxed and not that this happens by any means on a regular basis, but let's say there's a little minor earthquake, like things start shaking. The first thing I'm gonna do is uncross my legs and put my foot down. That's gonna jar those muscles and joints to basically say, okay, I'm not falling, I'm steady, and kind of help me know where my body is in space. So sometimes kids that are trying to seek out that, that deep, uh, joint and muscle input. They like to jump off of things. Um, they hug hard, they're rough. These are kids that when they drop to the ground love to be picked up because you're pulling all these muscles and joints and that can help them have an understanding of where their body is in space. I was listening to a, a little newscast or whatever on a Dateline or something like that and it was a kid that did a lot of this kind of hand flapping and whoever was doing the interview asked him why are you hand flapping and he he said it's the only way I know where my hands are like he he doesn't have a good feeling of where his body is and if you do that right now if you flap your hands and stop you have all this tingling and feeling in your hands you weren't even aware of your hands but when you do that it makes it very makes you very aware of that particular part of your body which is sometimes what kids are, are, are trying to seek so we have the vestibular the movement we have the proprioceptive the muscle joint input and then we also have the um, the touch and the the uh, part that has to do with being able to get input with touch and that kind of a thing. And so uh, two things that I learned in one of the workshops on, on sensory is that when it comes to touch and that kind of thing, your skin is the largest organ. So we're talking about a lot, of, a lot of places to get that input, but also that oftentimes people tolerate deep pressure touch better than light touch. So if you think about somebody like, kind of tickling the back of your neck versus deep pressure kind of kind of touch. And so I tell people that because sometimes when you're working with a child with autism that you don't know, and maybe they're not understanding the prompt that it's time to go to PE, so maybe we wanna kind of try to physically help move them in that direction. If you don't know the child very well, people tend to be like, okay, come on, honey, and you don't wanna to touch them very much. That actually could be worse because you're, you're um, touching them in a light way, which is more difficult sometimes for their skin and, and that sensory system to process. Uh, another thing I learned in, this, in the sensory workshop that I went to that was very interesting was that this uh, particular example that they gave, like let's say you're doing that uh, game that they do for Halloween where you're blindfolded or something's covered and you're supposed to put your hands down in something and you have no idea what it is, but it's actually like cold, wet, cooked spaghetti, but it's supposed to feel like brains or guts or something like that. And that feels really gross when you put your hands in there. If you just saw a bowl of cooked wet spaghetti sitting on the table and someone said to touch it, wouldn't be a big deal. Why? Because you can prepare your system for it. So in other words, touch can be tolerated better if you can prepare your system. That's why sometimes kids with autism don't like to be touched or hugged, but sometimes they'll hug you. It's because they can prepare their system for it. So those various areas really 
or en encompass all of the sensory areas that we talk about that help kids. And, you know, there's a lot of different things out there about what we do for the sensory pieces. I, you know, I oftentimes share, yes, kids benefit from sensory strategies. You know, there's not a lot of research that shows that a sensory diet works, but really sensory strategies can be very helpful. They can act as reinforcement. They can act as an alternative behavior. You know, all of us like certain sensory, sensory things. I, I like to drink my drinks with a straw. I like a heavy blanket when I'm cold. You know, there's different things. It's not to say that your body doesn't, everybody's body doesn't, enjoy versus sense, different sensory kinds of things, but a lot of times it, it has to do more with sensory strategies that can be used as reinforcement and those things that could be helpful. You just have to make sure that you don't let kids escape because you think that they need sensory breaks. Um, I'll have kids, you know, it's time for math and they start screaming, oh, they must need a sensory break and they take a sensory break and guess what? They're not doing the math. So you want to look at, again, using it as reinforcement, having them start the day that way, having them uh, have an opportunity to do some things. I always tell people like, you have a kid that runs in the hallway and you have them be on the scooter board to transition, guess what? You can't be on the scooter board and run at the same time. So it's a very specific behavior strategy called a DRI and it works very well. So when we really look at these things in terms of how they can interact with the treatment and behavior plan and all of those kinds of things, they can be helpful. Just be very careful that you don't use sensory strategies in a way that reinforces problem behavior because it can be very easy to do. So we have kids that can be hypersensitive or hyposensitive. We have sensitivity to bright light, the smell or the food, painful reactions, appear not to hear, seeks deep pressure, some of those kinds of things. Sometimes they put their hands over their ears, flicking their fingers, uh, having meltdowns in loud places like assemblies in the cafeteria, um, rocking, pacing, some of those kinds of things. So autism sensory disorder, uh, Autism spectrum disorder, sensory characteristics. This is a quote by Temple Grandin. When I was a child, large noisy gatherings of relatives were overwhelming and I would just lose control and throw temper tantrums. So she's describing how the sensory stuff was so overloading for her that it would cause her to have some, some temper tantrums and some behavior. So the last thing I wanna go over is just a way to help you remember these four areas, especially if you're in a school setting. It's important that you know the eligibility criteria for autism. And of course, everybody's minds forget, right? You'll listen to this webinar and two weeks from now, you'll be like, what, what were they again? I don't remember. But if we're working with kids with special ed or you have a student in your classroom with autism, I think it's a really good idea to make sure that you remember it. And as I was doing some of this training for the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, they asked that part of the training include all of the participants to do some kind of memory or mnemonic strategy to help remember those four areas. So we used to always have people get into groups and they would come up with their little ways to remember. So obviously we're not gonna do a group activity with a webinar, but I wanted to share one of my favorite ones because then maybe you can use it to help remember. So this particular group decided that they wanted to use the four characters that were in Winnie the Pooh or four of the characters in Winnie the Pooh to help remember the four areas of autism eligibility. So one was Winnie the Pooh, and he is to help remember developmental rates and sequences. I mean, we love the guy, but sometimes he's a little slow. And so that helps us remember development into developing those rates and those sequences, okay? We have speech language. Speech language is Piglet because he has a little bit of a stutter. What about sensory? Who's that? Tigger, right? He's bouncy, bouncy all over the place. And then we have relating to people, that's Eeyore, because he's often down in the dumps and not very fun to be around socially when he's having those kinds of uh, difficult moments. So those are the ways, uh, little things that you can use. You can come up with your own, uh, but oftentimes it's nice to use different strategies. Hopefully you can use that to help remember them because it'd be very great to make sure that you really have a good understanding of that criteria. I think sometimes people assume that if a child walks on their toes, they must have autism. 
And again, it really looks at all four areas, two mandated and two associated, but it's best practice to look at all those areas. A kid with a visual impairment rocks. It doesn't mean that the child has autism. So we have to kind of move away from thinking someone with sensory behaviors has autism and rather really understand that whole component of how we look at, at looking at that eligibility criteria, everything from communication to sensory to interactions. And again, remember what's classic is unevenness, that we really want to be able to identify that so we can help figure out the kids that need the services because of that diagnosis of autism.